Hi, and welcome to another Bible class emanating from True Light Christian Ministries. We are excited about uh, our study in Revelation. Uh, we're in chapter 18 this uh, afternoon, but it is great to have you with us. Uh, because of the coronavirus, obviously, uh, we're not able to meet as a uh, Bible class uh, in a normal way, but uh, we're doing the next best thing. So thanks for coming and being a part of this Bible class experience. As is our custom, we start out with I'm special. I'm special in all the world. There is nobody like me. Since the beginning of time, there has never been another person like me. Nobody has my smile. Nobody has my eyes, my nose, my hair, my voice. I'm special. No one can be found who has my handwriting. Nobody anywhere has my taste for food or music or art. No one sees things just as I do. In all of time, there's been no one who laughs like no one who cries like me. And what makes me laugh and cry will never provoke identical laughter and tears from anybody else ever. No one reacts to any situation just as I would react. I'm special. And I'm the only one in all of creation who has my set of abilities. Oh, there will always be somebody who is better at one of the things I'm good at. But no one in the universe can reach the quality of my combination of talents, ideas, abilities, and feelings. Like a room full of musical instruments, some may excel alone, but none can match the symphony and sound when all are played together. I'm a symphony. Through all of eternity, no one will ever look, talk, walk, think, or do like me. I'm special. I'm rare. And as in all rarity, there is great value. Because of my great rare value, I need not attempt to imitate others. I'll accept, yes, celebrate my differences. I'm special, and I'm beginning to realize it's no accident that I'm special. I'm beginning to see that God made me special for a very special purpose. He must have a job for me that no one else can do as well as I. Out of all the billions of applicants, only one is qualified. Only one has the right combination of what it takes. That one is me because I'm special. And we will just want you to know that you are special. God loves you. He made you. And he wants to have a uh, personal relationship with you. So even in this coronavirus, with isolation and distancing and mask wearing and all of the things that we're having to do, just know that you are special to God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this day, a day you have made. We've never seen it before and we shall never see it again. But God bless us in this day, especially as we go into Revelation chapter 18, God. We need your guidance. We need your spirit that is able to teach us the truths from your word. So God, we're depending on you and we're thanking you because we're going to get an understanding of this great uh, record that John left us. So God, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Revelation chapter 18 is going to be talking about Babylon is fallen. Now, in chapter 17, we saw the religious Babylon was, has fallen. But in chapter 18, the economic and political Babylon is going to be destroyed by none other, none other than God himself. So, chapter 18 starts out by reading, After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated, with his splendor and radiance. And he shouted with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen, certainly to be destroyed, is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every unclean spirit, 
and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird. For all the nations have drunk from the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings and political leaders of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth and economic power of her sensuous luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins, crimes, transgressions have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her wickedness and crimes for judgment. Repay to her, even as she has repaid others, and pay back to her double her torment in accordance with what she has done in the cup of sin and suffering which she mixed mix a double portion of perfect justice for her to the degree that she glorified herself and revealed reveled and gloated in her sensuality living deliciously and luxuriously to that same degree impose on her torment and anguish and mourning and grief for in her heart she boasts I sit as a queen on a throne and I am not a widow and will never ever see mourning or experience grief for this reason in a single day her plagues afflictions calamities will come pestilence and mourning and famine and she will be burned up with fire and completely consumed for strong and powerful is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings and political leaders of the earth who committed immorality and live luxuriously with her will weep and beat their chests in mourning over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing a long way off in fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, the strong city, Babylon, in a single hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and grieve over her, because no one buys their cargo, goods, merchandise anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, all kinds of citron scented wood and every article of ivory and every article of very costly and lavish wood, and bronze, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and spices, and incense, and perfume, and frankincense, and wine, and olive oil, and fine flour, and, and wheat, of cattle, and sheep, and cargoes of horses, and chariots, and carriages, and of slaves, and human lives. The ripe fruits and delicacies of your soul's desire have gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and extravagant are lost to you, never again to be found. The merchants who handled these articles, who grew wealthy from their business with her, will stand a long way off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, saying, Woe, woe, for the great city that was robed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, gilded and adorned with gold and precious stones and with pearls, because in one hour all the vast wealth has been laid waste, and every ship captain or navigator and every passenger and sailor and all who make their living by the sea stood a long way off and exclaimed as they watched the smoke of her burning, saying, What could be compared to the great city. And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich from her great wealth, because in one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints, God's people, and apostles and prophets who were martyred because God has executed vengeance for you through the righteous judgment upon her. 
Then a single powerful angel picked up a boulder like a great millstone and flung it into the sea, saying, With such violence will Babylon, the great city, be hurled down by the sudden spectacular judgment of God and will never again be found. And the sound of the harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will never again be heard in you. And no skilled artisan of any craft will ever again be found in you. And the sound of the millstone grinding grain will never again be heard in you, for commerce will no longer flourish and normal life will cease. And never again will the light of a lamp shine in you. And never again will the voice of the bridegroom and bride be heard in you. For your merchants were gr the great and prominent men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived and misled by your sorcery, your magic spells and poisonous charm. And in Babylon was found the blood of prophets and of saints, God's people, and of all those who have been slaughtered on the earth. That's the reading of uh, Revelation chapter 18. Now let's break down uh, Revelation chapter 18 by verses. Uh, here is an outline that will probably work for you. We get the background. Uh, there is a great angelic announcement in verse 1. The reasons why Babylon will be destroyed are given to us in verses 2 through 7. The quickness of Babylon's destruction is in verse 8. The impact of Babylon's fall is verses 9 through 20. The actual destruction of Babylon is verses 21 through 23. And the reason for Babylon's destruction repeated in verses 23 and 24. So what we see in chapter 18 is the total annihilation of a, uh, a city, a system that has been against God, and anything that is against God will not prevail. Praise God. There are five reasons why Babylon will be destroyed, and I want to give them to you up front. Number one, Babylon will be destroyed because of spiritual corruption. Oh my goodness. Spiritual corruption. Babylon, the great city of the end time, will not look to God. In other words, she thinks that she can make it all by herself. And when you think you are self-sufficient, you don't need God. And so God is going to bring calamity on this system, on this great city of the end time, because she has turned her back on God. The second reason why Babylon will be destroyed is Babylon, the great capital city, is going to be destroyed because the city corrupted nations, kings, and merchants. In verse 3, the word fornication tells us what this means. Fornication means spiritual fornication, the rejection of God and the turning to other gods. Um, you remember the Ten Commandments? Uh, one of the commandments was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you ever want to get God real angry real quick, erect an idol God and worship it instead of him. The world of the end time will be days of secularism, humanism, and materialism. Man will worship himself and his secular society. He will focus his life around technology, science, education, pleasures, recreation, and comforts. The third reason why Babylon will be destroyed is because the city will corrupt people through secularism. That's verses 4 and 5. One of the easiest things in the world is to become influenced by secularism. A secular society offers comfort, health, education, passions, pleasures, time, recreation, culture, and art. 
It offers all uh, that a people could ever want, physically and mentally, but it denies and rejects God. Therefore, the citizens of a secular society are led to focus life upon this world and nothing more. That's why, you know, some people believe when you're dead, you're done, because uh, if there's something coming after this life, there's going to be a whole bunch of people in trouble because of how they treat God's people today and because of their rejection of God. Babylon is going to be destroyed uh, fourthly, because uh, the city will take the lead in persecuting God's people. That's verse 6. Note the word, she rewarded you. The Antichrist and his government of Babylon will launch the worst holocaust the world has ever seen against believers, the Jews, and the religious faithful of the earth. Literally millions will be persecuted and killed in the most inhumane, and terrorizing ways imaginable. The wrath of God will fall upon the government and capital that launched this merciless slaughter of human life. Um, if you think the Spanish Inquisition was bad, uh, and it was, if you think that, that uh, the Holocaust was bad, and it was, slavery was bad, there have been times in history when uh, uh, people have been uh, tormented and executed uh, for little or no reason but just being different. Well, in this last day, the church, or, or not the church, but Christians, people who follow the Lord, will be slaughtered during the tribulation period. And because of that, God is going to uh, come after Babylon, and he himself is going to destroy Babylon. Now notice in chapter 17, it was not God who destroyed the religious Babylon, it was the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist does not want any semblance of God consciousness or anybody worshiping anything. And so he's going to destroy the religious Babylon. But in chapter 18, God is going to take care of the political and economic Babylon. The fifth reason why Babylon will be destroyed is because of self-glory, pride, selfish extravagance, and indulgence. You know, pride goeth before fall. And this city is going to sit so great and so vast and thinking that uh, she's, you know, great all by herself without God. And so God is going to have to come down here and, and destroy Babylon. Now, uh, the commercial Babylon, which represents the great worldwide system of the latter days, uh, religious Babylon, as I've already said, has been destroyed by the Antichrist. But what we see in chapter 18, we have uh, uh, different voices that we are listening to. So, for instance, in verses 1 through 3, we have the voice of judgment. Okay? This angel announces the fall of Babylon, an event that has already been announced in chapter 14, verse 8, and chapter 16, verse 19. The repetition of is fallen, is fallen suggests the dual judgment of the two chapters, religious and commercial Babylon as well as the statement in verse 6 that she would receive double for her sins. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad today for God's grace and God's mercy. Okay? When we talk about God's grace, God's grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. His mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. But as it relates to Babylon in these last times, not only is God going to pour out his wrath and destroy Babylon, but he's going to give her a double of what she has put out. And that's going to be devastating. Oh my goodness. This great city, the center of the world economic system, will finally 
get what she deserves from the hand of God. It has become a habitation of demons. Listen, you don't want to be anywhere where demons congregate. Okay? That's one of the reasons why when Jesus went to the land of the Gadarenes and found that guy who was living in the tombs, you know that guy was in trouble. Anybody that lives in a cemetery has got some serious problems. And so uh, he was demon-possessed. He was out of his mind. He was tearing himself with stones and, and reeking at the top of his lungs, and he was uncontrollable. Well, this city in the latter days is going to have just abundance of demons. And so it's going to be uh, destroyed. And uh, uh, they're going to be, Satan is, go, uh, is often pictured as a bird. In verse 13, verse 4, 19, 31, and 32. Verse 3 indicates that her influence over the nations of the earth has been as though men had become drunk with wine. She made them rich, and that is all that mattered to them. Some people, for the love of money, they'll do anything. Matter of fact, we had three theologians from uh, Canton, Ohio. Uh, they called the OJs. The OJs say, for the love of money, folk will sell their soul. Uh, it's not money that's the root of all evil, because you need money. Uh, my dad told me when I was growing up, he said, there are three things that you need to be successful in this world. You need God in your heart, you need some sense in your head, and you need some money in your pocket. And that for him was success. Well, there are some people who are godless. They don't think they need God. And so they put all of their trust in money. Well, money came by happiness, and money came by love. Praise God. The second voice that we hear is the voice of separation. That's chapter 18, verses 4 through 8. Some of God's people are in this city, Babylon, and God wants them to come out for two reasons. Number one, the city will be destroyed and he wants them saved. Uh, this kind of harkens back to, you remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, and God did rain down fire to destroy those two cities. And why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? It was because of their immorality. It was because they had rejected God. But also remember that there was a righteous person in Sodom his name was Lot. Now, Lot made some bad decisions, but he was a righteous man. And God went down and saved Lot and his wife and his daughters from that city. He took them out before he destroyed the city. In like manner, God is going to take out those who follow him in this Babylon situation before he destroys them. Now, I need to say that, uh, you know, Lot's wife, because she left Sodom, but Sodom didn't leave her. And God had told her not to turn back and don't look back. And when she looked back, of course, she was turned into a pillar of salt. The second reason uh, why God is calling out his people is that the city is satanic, and he does not want them to be defiled. And so he says, come out. Come out has always been God's call to his people. Right now in 2020, those of you who have perfect vision, who are seeing scripture as you ought to see it, you got to come from among uh, the unrighteous of the world. That does not mean that you isolate yourself from people. It simply means that you do not take up their lifestyle, that you do not associate uh, continually with uh, sinners. Birds of a feather flock together. Um, we are not to r run with sinners. We are to 
witness to sinners. We are to let sinners know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But you certainly don't uh, run with sinners, okay? Because association brings about assimilation. Some of the reason why some people are caught up in bad situations is because they got bad company. You got to watch the company that you keep. God's people uh, do not belong to the world or in the world. The world glorifies itself. Verse 7, the Christian seeks to glorify God. The world vies for the delicious pleasures of sin, while Christians live for the pleasures of Christ. Look at Babylon's pride in verse 7. I sit a queen and shall see no sorrow. But in verse 8, it indicates that she will exchange in one day her joys for sorrow, her riches for famine. There's a lesson here for God's people today. Be not partakers of other man's sins. That's in 1 Timothy 5.22. Thirdly, we hear the voice of mourning. This is chapter 18, verses 9 through 19. We see two Greeks, groups lamenting the fall of Babylon. The kings of the earth, in verse 9 and 10, and the merchants of the earth, in verses 11 through 19. They had committed fornications with Babylon by rejecting the true God and going after idols. Money in particular. Um, their luxuries. Living was not now at an end. I'm sorry. Their luxurious living was now at an end. Note the repetition of alas, alas, in verse 10, verse uh, 16, and 19. Babylon is judged in one day and one hour. How quick is God? God is quicker than right now. He's sooner than that once. And so when God says he's going to do a thing, it's already done. So this great city, with all of her luxury, with all of her uh, money, in one hour, God is going to destroy her. Why do the merchants and kings lament? Because their merchandise is now gone. Verses 12 and 13 indicates the vast wealth of the merchant system, including slaves and souls of men. And so we see that slavery is going to be very prominent during uh, this end time. Um, there will be an increase in slavery in the last days, for Satan has always wanted to enslave the souls and bodies of men. The rich will get richer. The poor will will get poorer. Both luxuries and necessities will be destroyed when God judges Babylon. Shipping will be destroyed and the shipping industry brought to ruin. Men today depend on the economic system to care for them, protect them, and satisfy them, but ultimately it will fail them. Praise God. We also hear the voice of rejoicing. That's uh, chapter 18, verses 20 through 24. The men of the earth never have the same viewpoint as the people of God. When Satan was cast out of heaven, heaven rejoiced, but earth mourned. That's chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Now that Babylon has been destroyed, heaven rejoices, but earth laments. The main reason for heaven's rejoicing is that the blood of the martyrs has been avenged by God. The Babylonian system is satanic. Okay, let me repeat this again. The Babylonian system is satanic. And from the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 4, has been responsible for the death of God's faithful people. The souls under the altar in Revelation 6 9 through 11, had asked, How long, O Lord? Now their prayers are answered. God has avenged their blood. 
You can also uh, look at Romans chapter 12, verse 19. The casting down of the millstone indicates the suddenness of God's judgment on the empire of the beast. Some students see in this millstone the return of Christ, the smiting stone, as pictured in Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 and 44 and 45. Let me remind you that in the book of Daniel, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had erected a statue. And the statue was great. And what the statue represented was world empires and world governments that had come, some had come, others were coming. But at the end of uh, looking at the statue, uh, Daniel said he saw a stone rolling down through um, the, the land and it destroyed the statue. That stone is the stone that the builders rejected. Jesus is called the chief cornerstone. And so what Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 2 is the destruction of world governments and systems ultimately and Jesus reigning in the end. And won't that be a great day when the Lord reigns omnipotent because Jesus is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. Now I know right now it doesn't look like that the Lord is reigning. It looks like that uh, evil is prevailing. And certainly, uh, here in America, we've almost reached 100,000 deaths because of this coronavirus. And it's hard to see uh, much good that is coming in this pandemic experience that we're having to go through. But rest assured that even though it looks evil and things are are looking bad that ultimately God is going to prevail. Weeping men do it for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm glad that God uh, prevails. Um, and let me just say this to you. Uh, you know, it wasn't long ago that we celebrated Easter. And Friday, I, you know, I, I always tell our church that uh, Friday didn't become good until Sunday. There wasn't nothing good about Jesus being crucified and uh, nailed to a cross and hung between thieves and hung between heaven and earth as if he was fit for neither. But early Sunday morning, God got him up. And so what happened that was bad on Friday became good because our redemption was secured because of Jesus getting up from the grave. Hallelujah. And just like uh, God took the thrill of victory from the jaws of defeat when he got Jesus up from the grave, he is going to destroy Babylon and Jesus will ultimately prevail. In Philippians chapter 2, it talks about Jesus, uh, you know, emptying himself and becoming a, a servant, a doulos. And he was found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, of things on earth, and of things under the earth. And every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One of these days, everything will have to bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so I'm excited to tell you that in spite of everything that's going on in the tribulation period, in great tribulation, that our God will prevail. I think that's a good place to end this. Victory is the Lord's. We have victory in Jesus. So that's a look at the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. And certainly we're going to uh, continue next Wednesday in chapter 19 as we motor on to the climax, the culmination 
of this great book of Revelation. I hope you're enjoying our uh, pilgrimage through the book. Uh, I get excited because I know we're going to get together on Wednesday, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. I'm praying for you. God loves you, and I do too. Until next week, God bless.